Just because you don't have anything to hide doesn't mean that you want everyone in the world to know everything that you do. Transparency Toolkit is a project to help journalists use information the same way that intelligence agencies do. So the same way that the NSA or GCHQ or other intelligences, intelligence agencies collect and analyze and use information. We're helping journalists automatically harvest information from public sources online to filter through that information so that they can understand it and figure out how to use it in stories that can actually be used to reveal surveillance programs or other secret things. So one of the programs that you developed is called ICWatch. What does it do and how does it work? ICWatch is a database of 70,000 LinkedIn profiles of people who are in the intelligence community, often working on surveillance programs, drone programs, kill lists, uh, working as interrogators at Guantanamo and other places, so wide range of activities. And we have um, programs that go and they automatically look for code words, things like X key score or other terms that don't necessarily mean much on their own, but we know from the Snowden disclosures and other whistleblowers that these are names of secret surveillance programs. So we look for those on the public internet and we find people who mention them and we can also then see what other code words are mentioning look for people who mention those. And so I see Watch is a collection of all of these different programs and people who are working on them in place. And there's this searchable database that allows people to look at this information and either just search through it by looking for code words or to browse which country the people are in and other things. I see what focuses on individual people. So you can see like person XYZ works with X key score and does use this analytic software. Um, why did you choose this approach? I think it's important to look at the picture from all levels from the individual level all the way up to the broader program levels. Because right now there's a lot of discussion about overall policies and surveillance programs, but these institutions and the people who are perpetuating these programs are actual people. The institutions are made up of people, individuals, and it's those people who are going to work every day and who are doing work that causes surveillance programs to go, that causes people to die in drone strikes. And I think it's important to understand their motivations for doing what they do, as well as what they do on a daily basis, because when we can do that, we can understand how these institutions function at a broader level as well. So there's a broader understanding of all levels. What was most surprising to me was there's a lot of people who are not just talking about surveillance programs, who are talking about being involved in deciding who to kill and in killing people and in torturing people, and that people are actually openly and publicly talking about this in ways that are actually not that difficult to detect. What is your opinion? What, what drives these people to work in the surveillance industries? I think some people actually legitimately think it's a way to improve the world. The intelligence community thinks that they're protecting their countries against terrorists and against other threats. And they don't they see the dark side of it until they're involved, if at all. And we also find people who have resumes who leave talk about leaving the intelligence community after calling for external review. One of my favorite people I found is a used car salesman that used to be for 20 years an intelligence analyst and he left after starting to get involved in analyzing intelligence from drones. So I don't think they're necessarily bad people. I think they maybe have different worldviews. Did you thought about also harvesting on uh, collecting data on different platforms? I don't know, maybe if, if Facebook would work? So we have a bunch of um, scrapers for job listing websites because there are also companies posting about the things that they're hiring for, which can be a good indicator of what they're working on. Um, we've looked into social media and we'll probably be adding that. That's particularly good. It's difficult to find people as a starting point on Twitter or Facebook because they don't necessarily talk about their work there. But once we've identified someone, we can go and we can see who their connections are on Twitter and Facebook and that will give us more people that might make sense to look at. Today's intelligence agencies, are they reformable or are they in any way compatible to a democracy? Even if today's intelligence agencies were put into a forum that was compatible with democracy and everything, all the information was being used properly, the fact that they have the apparatuses to collect this information means that if the government changes or if someone misuses the information, that that's, it could be misused, it could be misused to control people. I think it's a little bit like nuclear weapons, where you have a country where maybe it's friendly to you now, but maybe it won't be so friendly to you in the future. So it's important to have a very good idea of who actually has that capability. So that requires ongoing transparency. You're saying that the agencies should exist, but they should be transparent and you, that you control them in a way? I'm not sure they should exist in their current form, uh, but if they were reformed somehow in their current form, I think it would have to include 
a lot more transparency. I think an ideal situation would be something more distributed where people are actually involved in the intelligence collection and management processes for things that they thought were important issues rather than some sort of secret of cabal that's intercepting people's communications. There's a lot that can be done with open source intelligence to look at actual threats. It's a bit of a problem. I think there's also a lot of paranoia and fear and the intelligence agencies live on that fear and they build up that fear and in some ways I think that they exaggerate threats in people's minds so that they can continue to thrive on that fear. How does surveillance affect your daily life? In some ways it doesn't affect your daily life at all in an obvious ways, but in other ways it affects it entirely because there's always that possibility there that there's a bug on your phone, a bug in the room, that everything you're being typed is being watched and so it's impossible to know how much it affects your daily life, therefore it affects everything you do. A lot of people here also have the thought of not caring. Their argument is, I don't have anything to hide, so why should people care? Well, don't have anything to hide from who? I mean, I'm sure that most when people have things that they don't want their parents to know, that they don't want different people in different contexts to know. So maybe if you don't think you have something explicit to, really explicit to hide, there are things that you don't necessarily want everyone to know. And I think it's also beneficial to be able to have a space where you can think privately and you can speak privately. And when you can't do that, it's difficult to actually figure out what you want to say, figure out what you don't think at all. information we have about drones is what the government tells us, which over and over again proves to be a lie.